Well, good morning, church family. And uh, if you're listening at home or wherever you're listening um, today, um, I just pray that uh, what I have to say today is a blessing for you. I'd spent um, 10 months teaching English in Bangkok. And after I did that, I went and ended my adventure with a six-week self-guided tour around Europe. About week four of my trip, I, I got this bad cold in my nose and I ended up finding this little um, chemist in Munich to go and get some cold and flu tablets. But when I took them, they were just nothing like the cold and flu tablets that I'd had before and, and they didn't really do anything to help me at all. And um, to be honest, I didn't really have much time to be bothered with a cold. You know, I'd, I'd be up early every morning, going out, exploring something. And um, by week six, week six rolled around and I was in Rome. And I was planning on spending a, a week there with my friend Jenny. By this time, my cold had steadily got worse. The cold and flu tablets hadn't done anything. And I'm one of those people that when I get a cold, it nearly always goes to my chest. And I just put up with it as I coughed and, and I spluttered all around the, the Vatican and the Trevi Fountain and, and the Colosseum. And my friend kept saying, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be fine, you know, no worries. And as I'm walking through the, the Roman Colosseum, I just had so much trouble keeping up with Jenny. Like, just it was hard to breathe. And I was just feeling so lousy. Jenny uh, flew back to London the next day and, and I just lay low in this li little bungalow that, that we'd hired. I was heading home to Australia the next day and, and I just felt really sick. I emailed my mum and asked her to book me a doctor's appointment for as soon as I got back. And all of a sudden, I just felt really homesick. I'd enjoyed my time here in, in a different country, a whole new world that, to what I usually lived in. But now I knew it was going to be this long, arduous trip home, being sick. And all I wanted to do was to just be home and, and see my parents. It was the first real time in all of my travels that I felt homesick and alone. And I just wanted to be home where I knew that I was surrounded by, by love and care homesick. John 17 is one of those chapters that although I've read it many times, I've never spent real time just, just studying and, and meditating on it. The whole chapter is Jesus's prayer to God. And it's really touched my heart the last couple of weeks as, as I've prepared this sermon. It's in this chapter that we see Jesus' deep longing to be home, heaven. He was homesick. We easily forget that while Jesus was on earth as a man in our world, he was not really from this world. We see everything from, from our perspective and we easily see Jesus' earthly life but it's easy to forget what Jesus gave up to become human. Think for a moment what he left behind. Chapter 17 invites us to listen in on a conversation. We need this chapter highlighted in our Bibles because this is the very chapter that Jesus prays for you. Jesus talks about the tasks on earth that he's completed and, and he prays earnestly for his followers. This prayer gives us a glimpse of who 
Jesus really is in relation to the Father. It gives us a portrait of those things that, that are really close to his heart in these last few days of his life on earth. We were on Jesus' heart. Jesus prays earnestly for his followers in every generation. He prays that, that you and I will have spiritual unity. He prays for our mission and he prays for our eternal destiny. The full moon shines down on the garden. The stars twinkle in the black night of the sky. A few clouds drift over and a cool breeze is blowing. It's late at night and there in the shadows of the olive tree is Jesus. Sweat-soaked clothing, kneeling, imploring. His hair plastered to his wet forehead. Jesus is agonizing. He begins his prayer with starting that the hour that he has been referring to throughout his whole ministry is finally here. Not the hour for prayer, but the hour of the destiny for which he had been born was now here. He has never felt so alone as now. So homesick. No one else can do what he is about to do. Follow along with me in your Bibles as we read John chapter 17 verses 1 to 8. And this morning I've chosen to, to share it from the Message Bible because, you know, we often read it in our own version of the Bible, but it's sometimes nice just to hear it from a little bit of a different perspective. And so I'm going to read it from the message this morning. And it says this, John 17, 1 to 8. Father, it's time. Display the bright splendor of your sun, so the sun in turn may show your bright splendor. You put him in charge of everything human, so he might give real and eternal life to all in his charge. And this is the real and eternal life, that they know you, the one and only true God and Jesus Christ who you sent. I glorified you on earth by completing down to the last detail what you assigned me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with your very own splendor, the very splendor I had in your presence before there was a world. I spelled out your character in detail to the men and women you gave me. They were yours in the first place, then you gave them to me, and they have now done what you said. They know now, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that everything you gave me is firsthand from you. For the message you gave me, I gave them, and they took it and were convinced that I came from you. They believed that you sent me. Verses 1 to 8, Jesus talks to God and tells him that everything he did was to bring the Father glory. He carried out the plans that, that they had set before the world had begun, down to the very last detail. He showed God's character to all people in person. He shared God's message to people. He made God known and, and displayed to people who God is and what he does. Why? Why did he do that? So you and I can have eternal life. You know, verse 3 says, this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the one, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to the earth. 
Jesus defined eternal life as knowing God. Having a relationship with God and his son, Jesus. That's what he says eternal life is. To know. It's not just to to intellectually know about God, but it's a word that describes relationship of a close friend, even of, of people who are married. The Godhead desires a relationship with me, with you. God's a social being. He desires community. He yearns for conversation with us. This prayer of Jesus also highlights to us the relationship that existed between God the Father and God the Son. Jesus acknowledges that he had lived in God's very presence. That's why Jesus is homesick. The world as we know it was not actually his true home. He's come, he's done what he has wanted and needed to do, but now He's ready to go home. You know, we're so loved by God with that same kind of love that he has for Jesus. Our life is transformed by the life and love of Jesus. His last desire is to love his followers and dwell in them, to fill them with the glory and the joy he has known so that our knowledge of God won't be able to be compared to anything else because it's so great. Then Jesus moves on quickly and he turns his attention to praying for his followers. Firstly, his disciples and then for all people in every generation that follow, who choose to follow him. John 17 verses 9 to 26 and and I want to read it all this morning because I just feel that there's a real blessing that we can gain when when we read the whole passage and and we listen and what it speaks to us and again I'm going to read from the message I pray for them that's his disciples I'm not praying for the the God rejecting world but for those you gave me for, th- for they are yours by right. Everything mine is yours and yours mine and my life is on display in them. For I'm no longer going to be visible in the world. They'll continue in the world while I return to you. Holy Father, guard them as they pursue this life that you conferred as a gift through me so that they can be one heart and mind as we are one heart and mind. As long as I was with them, I guarded them in their pursuit of the life you gave through me. I even posted a night watch and not one of them got away, except for the rebel bent on destruction, the exception that proved the rule of scripture. Now I'm returning to you. I'm saying these things in the world's hearing so my people can experience my joy completed in them. I gave them your word. The godless world hated them because of it, because they didn't join the world's ways. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you guard them from the evil one. They are no more defined by the world than I am defined by the world. Make them holy, consecrated with the truth. Your word is consecrating truth. In the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. I'm consecrating myself for their sakes so they'll be truth consecrated in their mission. I'm praying not only for them but but also for those who will believe in me because of them and their witness about me. The goal is for all of them to become one heart and mind, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so they might be one heart and mind with us. Then the world might believe that you, in fact, sent me. The same glory you gave me, I gave them, so they'll be as unified and together as we are, I in them and you in me. 
then they'll be mature in this oneness and give the godless world evidence that you've sent me and love them in the same way you've loved me. Father, I want those you gave me to be with me right where I am so they can see my glory, the splendor you gave me, having loved me long before there ever was a world. Righteous Father, the world has never known you, but I have known you. And these disciples know that you sent me on this mission. I have made you very, I have made your very being known to them who you are and what you do and continue to make it known so that your love for me might be in them exactly as I am in them. It's a beautiful prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. The principles of this prayer apply to all of us, not just to the disciples. As I've studied through this prayer the last couple of weeks, I, th I see three specific needs that Jesus is praying for us about. Our destiny, our unity, and our mission. The first theme that runs through Jesus' prayer for us is our destiny. I get this image in the prayer of a shepherd again. You know, someone who's guarding and guiding their, their sheep. Verse 11, Jesus asked God to protect his followers or guard them as they pursue life. Jesus is not asking God to take us out of the world, but to guard us from Satan. You know, Charles Swindle's book on John suggests that Jesus never encourages us to retreat away from the world physically and spiritually. He wants the darkness of the world to, to light up with, with lots of tiny little lights. You know, think of Christmas lights in the dark. He asks his father to give us insulation, not isolation. Jesus basically asks his father, insulate believers so they can move among evil without being burned by the evil one. How easy is it to bow to temptation? To get tangled up in Satan's web if we're not ins insulated. You know, I forget so often that there is a battle going on for my life and yours. I need to know the word to know truth, to use the armor of God that, that's listed in Ephesians chapter 6. In verse um, 24, Jesus says that, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. You know, Jesus is not preparing, it, sorry, Jesus is not only preparing a place for us, but he is so keen that every one of us join him and for us to see his glory and to witness for ourselves the tremendous love that, that God has for Jesus and for us. And this prayer invites us to, to reflect on, on what this means in our own spiritual life. How will it change our living and our praying if we fill our imaginations with such a picture? How will it change my investment in the world if we are genuinely en route to the place where we will see God's glory? It's like we're, we're on a train heading out into the countryside with our, our passports in hand and speeding along and, and talking to people at all the platforms and, and about why they need to get on board too. How will our vision of eternity change our view of the world? 
our mission, our evangelism? How does it how does it change our view of suffering? Heaven is our true home. We too are homesick and we want to go home. You know, sitting in that Roman bungalow feeling so sick, I too just wanted to go home. I was now on my own, quite a distance from central Rome and and the airport. And so I loaded up my pack that morning and I knew it was going to be a struggle. And I got to the train station to find that overnight the train drivers had gone on strike. And I had to catch this overcrowded bus. And I stood in this bus hanging onto this strap at the top with my heavy backpack on the back. And all of a sudden, for those of you that have experienced this, you'll know what I'm talking about. I felt this feeling that I was about to faint. And I knew that I just had to sit down. And I prayed. Prayed like I never had because this was not the place I wanted to faint. And someone noticed how I was looking and thankfully they offered me a seat and I eventually made it to the airport without fainting. I booked in and sat in my seat for that long flight to Singapore. I felt crook. My temperature was now soaring. My breathing was labored because I, I get asthma. And my, my seat neighbors in the plane had some Panadol and, and they gave it to me and it was enough to get me through to, to Singapore and my accommodation. And, and upon arriving at my accommodation, the first thing I asked as I checked in, I said, can you book me a taxi? I need to go to the hospital because I knew I was just really unwell. It was about 8 p.m. And the doctor told me that I had a lung infection. And he gave me some medication to sort of tide me over and, until I, I flew back to Australia in three days' time. And he told me that it would take me six weeks to recover and that I, I really needed to see a doctor when I, when I got home. So hence, I didn't really get to see a lot of Singapore. You know, there's nothing like arriving home when you walk through the gates of the terminal and you see your loved ones and you know that you're home. And yes, it did take me a full six weeks to recover. Arriving at our earthly home is one thing, but imagine what it will be like when we arrive at our true heavenly home. What a day that will be. That is what Jesus desires for us. He has planned, he's planted eternity in our hearts and can't wait to share that with us. And so he prays that God will keep us safe from Satan until he comes to collect us and bring us home. Secondly, Jesus prays for unity among his followers because Jesus mentions unity three times in this prayer. He prays that we will experience unity like the first disciples. A church, a group of believers that will be a genuine community of strong unity. It's interesting that if we continue to follow that, that theme of unity that John portrays into his other letters in the New Testament, we see that the disunity that John's church was not, was not unlike the disunity that we can experience today. We can all meet together under the name of Jesus but then also in his name, challenge and oppose all sorts of pet thoughts and ideas that, that we feel should be done differently. But unity is not uniformity either. 
but it's celebrating our differences and using empathy to see from another person's point of view. We understand unity, well, at least know what we should do. The problem is that we also know that there are times when unity comes at a high cost. You know, like when differences of opinions happen, unity often can only be achieved when one person or both people in the party concede and, and give way to some degree. So peace is restored. Jesus' prayer links the unity of believers to our spiritual life. He suggests that the oneness that we experience with him should lead to oneness with each other. You know, apparently in, in World War II, um, Hitler commanded religious groups to unite so that, so that he could control them. And among all the different groups, as you can imagine, there's, there's lots of different religious groups. Half complied and half refused. And those who went along with the order had a much easier time during the war. Those who didn't faced harsh, harsh persecution. In almost every family of those who resisted, someone died in a concentration camp. And when the war was over, there were these feelings of, of bitterness and, and tension that ran deep between all the different groups. And finally, they decided that, that the situation had to be healed. Leaders from each group met at this quiet retreat. And for several days, each person spent time in prayer, examining his or her own heart in the light of Jesus' commands. And then they came back together. And Francis Schaeffer, an, an American evangelist who, who told of this incident, asked his friend who was there, well, what happened next? You know, and, and they replied, we were just one. As they confessed their hostility and, and their bitterness to God and yielded to his, his control, the Holy Spirit created a spirit, spirit of unity among them. And love filled their hearts and dissolved the hatred. You know, when love prevails among believers, especially in times of strong disagreement, it presents to the world an indisputable mark of a true follower of Jesus. And that is why I believe Jesus keeps repeating this, this new command that his followers love one another. Without a courageous love, similar to Jesus' love, unity is impossible. If there is disunity among us, let us look with empathy putting ourselves in someone else's shoes and, and a willing heart, be prepared to allow the Holy Spirit to work on our hearts too. You know, it may not be some huge disagreement. It might be that we just have a difference of opinion. What would it take if I looked at that from the other person's shoes? And that leads us to the third specific need that Jesus prays for, and that is our mission. What does Jesus say our mission is? Is it sharing Jesus? Is it, um, sh um, you know, sharing end time messages? Is it making disciples? What is it? All of these are great, but in this prayer, Jesus says what our mission is. It's love. Love. Let that sink in for a moment. Our mission is love. 
when we accept Jesus into our lives, when we let the Holy Spirit dwell within us, our life begins to be transformed by the love of Jesus. And that love should flow out from us to others. And this means that the church will have a quality of life that so stands out from what is available in the world that the world takes notice. Christians offer the world a priceless gift. Something the world is seeking desperately. People today are searching for places where God seems present, where he can be felt. What better way than coming to church where people feel God by the way they are loved into the church? When we are one with Christ and one with each, with each other, it's inevitable that the church will grow. The other part of the mission that Jesus prays for is that our lives glorify God. That we will exhibit in all of our worship, our words, our work, the same glory that Jesus exhibited on earth. The mission for us as a church community is to invite people to touch the glory of God. To be changed by it and to take it to the world. You know, John 15 and verse 8 says that when we are true disciples, we will produce fruit. And it is this fruit that brings God glory. This idea forces me to ask hard questions about every aspect of what I do. Is God glorified here in what I'm doing? The answers will not always be obvious or easy, but they need to be asked and pondered. This was the essential mission of Jesus' incarnate life and now is the essential mission of the church, glorifying God. Through our lives, through our love and through our unity with one another, God will be glorified and people will see and they'll want to be part of it. John 17, we get this incredible, intimate picture of Jesus' relationship with the Father. We get to see the things that, that touch his heart and that, and that he brings before the Father. Jesus prays for us. He chooses to do that for you and for me. We need to highlight it in our Bibles. When Jesus stepped into that garden, you were in his thoughts. When he thought about heaven and eternity, he saw you and I. His final prayer was recorded for us. What lays ahead of Jesus is something that I just can't even imagine having to go through. But he couldn't not go through with it because he saw you and I. Jesus experienced all the things that we struggle with. He understands that the world isn't always fair. Bodies get sick and hearts grow weak. Jesus wanted to put an end to that for all time. And so here in the garden, Matthew shares with us in his gospel that he even asks that if it was possible, could the father take away the cup of suffering? But it's also here in the garden that he saw you and I and, and he made his decision. Now I want to finish with this, this quote from, from Max Licardo because he puts it this way. Jesus would rather go to hell for you than to go to heaven without you. So he steps away from the garden having made his decision. He turns resolutely to face what is before him, all for love. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, your great love for me and for everybody listening and for this whole world is something that I just can't imagine. But your love is so great that you sacrificed your own life for us. You wanted 
us in heaven to be with you. Lord, help us every day to catch a glimpse of that and reorientate our lives every day to you. Thank you for everything that you have done for us. In your name we pray. Amen.